dreams will mean this summer. We're just picking up from that point to say a summer is still going to occur this year and it will bring climate challenges with it. Um, just briefly, we'll cover a bit of the feedback from last time, was, which was remind us where we can get information on species vulnerability. Um, will you cover anything about the subantarctic region of Australia? <clears throat> and then can you conclude today's presentation with a bit of guidance about what are appropriate responses given this far out from the warm temperatures that we are predicting? Um, that kind of feedback is really great and I appreciate it last time. Um, over the past decade, we've learned a lot about species vulnerability to long-term climate change and some work that FRDC had sponsored over the um, previous 10 years or so looked at how much data we had on species around Australia and in five areas around Australia, say 99 key wild fisheries species, we have enough data on somewhere between 33 and 44 percent of those species to understand the climate risk. Um, but that's to long-term climate change. What about these extreme events? And on the next slide, there's not as much information on extreme event responses. But for example, in the first panel on the left-hand side, this is a meta-analysis from global studies for marine heat wave effects. If you are a taxa listed on the left-hand side and you're to the left of the dotted line, a marine heat wave means bad news. If you're a taxa to the right-hand side of the zero line, it's good news. And of 26 studies on mobile invertebrates, which are largely squid, they're the ones, one group that has a really positive effect from marine heat waves. And that's because their growth speeds up, they expand into new areas, and fisheries on squids tend to do better in warm periods of time. Every other taxa group, and the number of studies is indicated in brackets, um, tend to have negative effects. And the biggest negative effect of a marine heat wave is on corals, with 56 studies generally having showing that magnitude of negative effect. Um, for marine habitats, the effect of heat waves are always negative. And each of these graphs shows for seagrass on the top and giant kelp on the bottom, how the impact increases with the number of days of marine heat wave that we'll have in a 12 month period of time. On the right hand side, depending on where the marine heat wave hits the species that you care about, the result differs. If the species is living in the hot part of its range, the warm edge, the marine heat wave effect will be stronger on that species because it's closer to its thermal maximum compared to species that live at the cold edge. So if you've got an animal living in Tasmania that's also found in Queensland, a Tasmanian heat wave won't be as bad for that species as a Queensland heat wave would be for it because in Queensland it's already challenged by warm temperatures. So in general with those principles, most species suffer negative impact it's always negative on the habitats. They can't go anywhere else. And generally in the southern part of the range, it's a little bit better for species than in the northern part of their range. Thanks, Claire. And so for Australian region then, we've got these kind of vulnerability assessments, again, available from the FIDC web pages that tell us how different species might be impacted by warming. Um, and that's a pretty broad scan at the moment. And those impacts of warning of warming can be on how many there are, where they're found and how they live their lives. Um, and I do urge you to um, dig up that literature and Claire and I will put some updates on where to find that stuff um, after the presentation. We just wanted to share with you that there is information out there for, based on the last decade or so of work. Okay, thanks Alistair. So that was a, um, that covered off some of the feedback that we got from our last presentation. So I'll step through the current ocean conditions, give everyone a bit of a context um, for where the forecasts are now then going to take us. So this is just a bit of an overview of the last month or so. So this is um, for July and it's just putting it in context with the, what the plot on the left is showing all the other July since 1900 sea surface temperature around Australia. So it will vary depending on your particular location, but you can see that this past July um, was pretty warm. It wasn't in our top, you know, top three or anything, but it's definitely up there in terms of um, other Julys in recent years. On the right hand side, same sort of information, but instead it's mapped around Australia. So anywhere that is darkest orange is the hottest on record. That sort of light orange colour is in the top 10% of temperatures that have been experienced in that location in the last 100 odd years. So you can see across northern Australia and all the, most of the east coast down to probably northern New South Wales and offshore have been in that top 10%. So very much above average. So what we're saying there is that the last month was already warm. 
So the next step is then to look at what are we going into? We're starting from a warm place already. And this information is all available available on the Bureau's web pages as well. And I've put the link to each of these maps. So um, later on with Jamie um, and the other FRDC folks hand around the slide pack, you can click on those links and go and have a look yourself if you're keen to. So this is satellite information. This is um, sea surface temperature again, global, and it's for the last week. So it's, it's got here centered on the um, last Thursday. And you can see there's not a lot doing on this map around Australia based due to the scale. So anywhere yellow is around one, one and a half degrees warmer than it would be normally for this um, this past week over the last um, 40 odd years. One of the, um, I was going to say, pardon the pun, hot topics at the moment is the El Nino that's developing in the Eastern Pacific. And that's what you can see here. That's this signal here. You've got warm water happening off um, South America, and it's stretching across the Pacific. So we'll go into a bit more info around that um, in the following slides. This is from the Marine Heat Wave Tracker. So same kind of information is going into it. There's a satellite picture of sea surface temperature, except now we're looking at where those temperatures are really warm. So where they're in that top 10% that's been experienced in those locations. So anywhere that's uh, this kind of yellow colour is a moderate marine heat wave. And as the colour gets darker and more intense, that indicates the marine heat wave is getting stronger and more intense. So this is from a couple of days ago. And so you can see um, well, the Great Barrier Reef and a little bit of the Coral Sea lighting up. And then there's also um, indication of a marine heat wave down off the coast of Victoria and parts of Tassie. Luckily, we're not in New Zealand because they're cooking at the moment still. Um, but there is there are marine heatwave conditions at the moment in around Australia. So one of the um, questions we got last time was, well, how how do we know whether the forecasts are any good? So these are the two forecasts for sea surface temperature that we presented in the last briefing. So one of my team members have, has plotted up what the actual temperatures were. So using the same baseline. So these are anomalies, which means sort of the difference from what you would normally expect this time of year. That's based on the last 40 years. So here on the top left, this is what we showed for July. This is our forecast for July around Australia, based on what you'd normally expect in July. And this is what we, this was what was observed. So, it was really warm here in the Coral Sea and off the Great Barrier Reef, and the model has predicted that. It's actually underestimated some of the heat, um, it extends further offshore. And some of that heat has also moved into um, across Northern Australia. Tassie and down off the New South Wales coast and parts of Victoria, the model indicated they were gonna be significantly warmer than normal, and that is what was observed as well. For August, given that we're not all the way through August yet, um, these aren't quite comparing apples with apples. So this is the forecast we predicted or we, we presented, sorry, for August. The one on the right is just for the first 21 days of August. Okay, so it's not the whole month, um, but you can see the pattern. I'm just moving my laptop so I can see it. Is um, It's a pretty good match. So we're showing this heat still persisting in the Coral Sea down the reef, and then it's really starting to light up in the, um, the Tasman Sea here and around Tassie. So there is a bit of extra heat here that the model was predicting for August, but like, well, sorry, it was observed actually, um, and also some off the Northwest Shelf. But the big patterns of where the ocean is really warm, considerably warmer than normal, so up around one and a half, two degrees, um, the model gave a good indication of that back when we talked to you in June. We also showed you some trial marine heat wave forecasts. So these aren't publicly available, um, but we're using them and testing them with people um, so people get used to seeing them. So this was the forecast we showed in July. So we were showing moderate marine heat wave conditions, Coral Sea, Great Barrier Reef, and around Tassie and parts of um, Victoria. So I've swapped these around. So the, the forecast is on the right, on the left, it's not exactly the same domain um, plotted, but you can see we did a pretty good job of predicting marine heat wave conditions all through the Coral Sea and down the reef, and then parts around Tassie as well. If we look at August, uh, sorry, yeah, August. Um, again, not apples and apples because we haven't got all of August yet, but um, 
the model was predicting marine heatwave conditions in, around Tassie and off the coast of Queensland, and that's what we've been seeing for the last, this is the last 28 days, so the end of, bit of end of July and um, up to the 22nd of August. So, um, and then on the WA coast and on South Australia, marine heatwave conditions were not predicted and we were, also didn't observe them. So that the way we the reason we're showing those is so people can think well okay that's what the forecast told me last time did it actually get it um, and then it also provides an opportunity to talk about well if it didn't get it why not and what is also driving um, those temperatures so that's what we'll step into next so this is the outlook for the next three months so September through to November and so I haven't included anything on the model um, in this particular briefing. So if you are interested, you can have a look at our first briefing. But essentially, all these forecasts are coming from the Bureau's model. They're all coming from the same model. It models the atmosphere and the ocean. So what's happening in the ocean model affects what's happening in the atmosphere model and vice versa. So this is the forecast um, from September to November. And so this is the information we've got for the subantarctic folks. So I did go and have a bit of a look and we don't have at the actual region itself. Um, mapped out at the moment, but you can see it down here on the, um, or Heard Island down on the global map. So what we're showing here is that developing El Nino. Um, you can see it's really ramping up. This is one of the, the average temperature in this box here is what we call the Nino 3-4 index. And so the Bureau has basically a re recipe or an ingredient list of um, indicators that it looks at Bef and they need to all be satisfied before an El Nino is announced. So this is one of the ocean um, indexes that we use. And once that goes above 0.8 degrees, um, that's one of, that indicator is satisfied. The other big climate driver that affects ocean conditions and also Australian climate is the Indian Ocean Dipole. So that's the difference between these two boxes here um, in the Western and Eastern Indian Ocean. So I'll show you those in the next couple of slides. So on average, the conditions around Australia are warmer than normal. They're not up here in the three to four degrees, but there is still heat down here. Oh, sorry. There's heat down here. Off, um, can somebody mute whoever's yeah. Yeah, talking? Absolutely. Or Jamie, can you mute, mute them, please? Thanks. Okay. You'll just have to unmute yourself, Claire. All right, I'm back. Okay. Yep. <laughs> um, all right, so we'll first we'll talk about ENSO. So that's where we were talking about an El Nino or a La Nina. So the Bureau's official status on the current conditions, so the conditions right now, is that it's an El Nino alert. But the forecasts are all indicating that an El Nino will develop in the future. So. That means um, the, not all the indicators that the Bureau looks at to, to say it is an El Nino have been ticked yet, but the models are all indicating it is going to happen, um, most likely in the spring. So that's why we're still sitting at alert here. So this is the, the Bureau's model, Access S, and these grey lines here, the model runs 99, um, we have a Sorry, we have an ensemble of 99 model forecasts. That's because we can't perfectly start the model with exactly realistic conditions. We've got observations scattered all over the place and there's areas associated with those observations. So what we do is put those observations together and say, this is our best guess of the ocean condition right now, best guess for the atmosphere, and then we run the model. But we run it multiple times, so it will give an indication of the likelihood of events happening. So as you can see here, all that grey spaghetti or all those model runs, they are all well sitting in this pink part, which is above the 0.8 for an El Nino event. And that's that box in the Pacific I showed on that earlier um, map, Nino, the Nino 3-4 box. The other thing the Bureau does, it looks at a, lots of other models from other centres around the world and to see where our model access S is tracking. So these three boxes, down the right hand side here, we've got the top one is for September, which is this um, first dot here. So this green line is the average of all those gray lines. Next one is October and the bottom one here is November. 
And from all the models you can see that we look at, so we look at the US's model, the UK, the European model, they're all indicating an El Nino for the, um, developing over the next three months. So the Bureau's model is right in there. Um, and so the consensus is globally that we're heading into one. The IAD, so the Indian Ocean Dipole, so that's the difference between Eastern and Western Indian Ocean. At the moment, it's currently neutral. So our forecasts are indicating a positive IAD is likely to occur. So a positive IAD means it's cooler on the um, Eastern Indian Ocean and warmer on the Western Indian Ocean. So this is our model again here. Once it goes above this um, pink dotted line, it's, it indicates a positive IAD. When we look at the other models, um, we've got another five or six here. They're all indicating positive IOD, though they're not all in agreement how strong that mod how strong that event will be. And that's because all these models are different. So they all have different strengths and weaknesses, and that's why it's really useful to look at them all together to get a picture for what's going to happen. So the main impact from an IOD um, is it suppresses rainfall. So if you're an, um, based in estuaries or um, river owned fisheries or you need a fresh water source, then um, it's likely to be lower rainfall um, for the next three months. So an IOD usually disappears by around December. The monsoon when it kicks off in Northern Australia, that's usually the end of an Indian Ocean Dipole event. So it doesn't persist like an El Nino event through summer. Okay, so what does our rainfall look like? So I showed these in the last um, presentation. They're also available at the, on the Bureau's webpage. So basically a drier than normal September through to November. So the one on the left here is showing the chance of it being above median rainfall. So a very little chance that it's gonna be above median. Brown is around 20%. Um, and the one on the right is showing the chance of unusually low rainfall. So that is defined as the lowest 20% a rainfall you would expect um, for that season in those locations. So it's a pretty good chance, particularly down here in um, southwest WA and across much of the country, um, uh, well, an increased chance of really low rainfall. And that's that combination of an El Nino um, that leads to decreased rainfall and then the positive IOD coming in as well and really exacerbating that. Also, this is our air temperature outlook. So this is for daytime temperatures. The nighttime temperatures look pretty similar. On the left here is chance of above median. Everywhere is red, pretty high chance it's gonna be pretty warm going into the um, next three months. On the right, it's showing the same as the rainfall, except this time we're looking at the top 20%. So it's looking like it's gonna be pretty warm um, three months for much of WA. Uh, and around sort of South Australia, around Spencer Gulf as well, parts of, um, if you're on, we look on the coast, bits of Tassie and also in the north. So the darker the colour, the higher the chance it'll be in that uh, top 20% of air temperature for the next three months. Okay, getting back into the water. So now we're looking at the same model that we're looking at the ocean model component. So this is a sea surface temperature. This is your top one metre. Um, and if you can see on your screen that it looks like it's quite pixelated, each of those little pixels is a 25 kilometre by 25 kilometre box, and that's what comes out of the model. So this is the forecast. These ones were released on the 23rd for the next two weeks, so through until the start of September, and then sort of around week one to middle of September on the right here. So it's showing that persistent heat all down the east coast. So quite warm in the Coral Sea. So we've got anomalies up around 0.8 or one degree warmer than normal for this um, fortnight. And then warming up down the coast, um, New South Wales, Victoria and around Tassie. That seems to be a pretty common story actually for Tassie. It seems to be warm a lot there. Same kind of pattern heading into the next fortnight as well. Cool on the east, I'm oh, sorry, cool on the west coast, um, a little bit of warmth on the northwest shelf, but not a lot. So it's only around half a degree warmer than normal. Um, these plots are all available online and they are also available for smaller regions. So uh, state regions, except for WA where there's north and south WA, so you can get a bit closer look to your, your particular patch. 
The other thing to bear in mind is how accurate the model is. So what we do is we run 40 years of what we call hindcasts. We go back and look at the model and say, okay, when there was, you know, we had these big events here, did the model get them? And um, if not, why not? And then we also look at when we have, say, big El Nino or La Nina events, you know, did we predict the conditions around Australia? So everywhere that's green or dark green, the model's done a good job based on those 40 years of forecasts. And anywhere that's white, that means the model hasn't done a good job for that spot at this time. So for the next two fortnights, the model skills pretty good, coastal areas um, and off northern Australia. Um, and as you go forward in time, the further out you're trying to predict, generally it's harder for the models to get it right. So that's your accuracy starts dropping off. We then step into the next three months. So across the top, we've got September, October, November, and underneath we've got those accuracy maps. So again, anywhere green, the model's got good confidence in those predictions. Anywhere where there's a lot of eddies or a lot of... Um, ocean activity, that's pretty hard for these models to get the eddies in exactly the right spots. And that's why you can see these white patches developing off the um, coast of New South Wales, because it's hard for the model to get them right. Pretty similar story to our two fortnights. Um, we've got warmth in the Coral Sea, and then quite warm down sort of southern Queensland, New South Wales, and parts of Victoria, and then off the east coast of Tasmania. And that heat's looking to persist through to the next three months. Coral Sea starts backing off in November, but now it's really starting to warm up here in the eastern Tasman. And so bearing in mind, these are anomalies. And so these are differences from what you'd expect in November, this one here. So you're, sorry, I've lost my mouse. There we go. So these actual temperatures are, are getting pretty warm. So that's around one and a half, two degrees warmer than what you'd normally get in November. And as you can see on the bottom here, the accuracy or the confidence of the model is reasonably good for the next three months, though it does drop off in those places where there's lots of eddies going on. The other regions where the model doesn't do a great job, if there's lots of synoptic or lots of weather scale activities, it's really hard for these kind of models to predict months out. When you've got a really big driver like El Nino, that's what these models are great at capturing, the impacts of those kind of drivers. Okay, so we've got last couple of um, Outlook slides. So these are back to, uh, looking at marine heat waves. So just as a reminder, that's that top 10% of your sea surface temperatures in those locations for that time of year. So these are trial forecasts. They're not publicly available yet. So we've got the next three months here, September, October, and November. And so what these plots are showing, if you remember from the um, the Nino 3.4 and the IOD plots, we had that grey spaghetti. So those 99 forecasts, what we do is each grid cell, we look at those 99 forecasts and we say how many of them fall in that top 10%. And that's what we've coloured here. So anywhere that's that dark green colour, that's showing 80 to 100% of those 99 forecasts are falling in that top percent. So it gives an idea of the likelihood of a marine heat wave forming. And it pretty much follows, as you would expect, those patterns that we saw in the sea surface temperatures. So for September, pretty high chance um, in parts of the Coral Sea and quite a high chance down New South Wales and off Tassie. And that high likelihood persists for New South Wales, Victoria and Tassie through to October and November. If we then step forward and have a look at, so that's looking at all those 99 forecasts. We can also take the average of them and then see what marine heat wave category the model is indicating. So that's what this, the colours on these maps show. Again, September, October, November, same areas are lighting up for a moderate marine heat wave. Parts of the Coral Sea in September, New South Wales, um, parts of Victoria and off Tassie. Moderate marine heat wave again persisted for October, sorry, predicted for October and November down um, southern Queensland, New South Wales, and you can start to see a um, strong marine heat waves starting to develop off in the Western Tasman Sea. Okay, back to Alistair. So that's, that's the, sort of the end of the forecast, but keep hold of your questions, drop them in the chat, um, and we can, we can step through some of them.
but I'll pass over to Alistair now to to sum up and Judy, um, thanks, Claire. We hope that sharing these forecasts will improve the responses that you might need to undertake as a policymaker, a manager, a researcher, or an industry um, decision maker. And again, depending on your ability to manipulate your system, the regulatory environment that you're in, the market forces, the value. Um, I hope by attending this, it indicates there's strong leadership and influence interest in doing something, social expectations, and the strength or visibility of impacts all will influence your ability to do something about these marine heat waves um, and the future conditions. Um, what are people doing then to prepare for these changes? For long-term changes, for example, fisheries around Australia are developing adaptation plans and a project led by Beth Fulton is helping Commonwealth and state fisheries agencies develop a long-term plan. That's one aspect, but what about um, variability in extreme events. We can suggest that you use the preparation window to start doing some things now. And we're up to, uh, in terms of a seasonal cycle, we're in the August-September period, whereas we've just been through, there are some pretty strong events being forecast that will, uh, we think, begin to emerge by November. And although we're not looking that far ahead, previous experience would suggest persisting through February. So if step one, we would consider the first briefing that we did was just about assessing the risk. We think you're at a phase now of thinking about planning your responses. Perhaps the next briefing, we might be in some of these strong events and we might talk more about what you might be doing inside those events. And then finally, come um, March, April, we'll be looking at what we could do better next time in preparing for uh, strong events. So let's look at some of those short term responses. Um, in the first step, and if you're in an area that has is not having an air, a marine heat wave predicted, on the left hand side is some set of options that you might be choosing to do right now in order to assess the risk. Hopefully these don't cost too much money or foreclose on future options. But generally I could characterise those things on the left hand side about being assessing your risk and vulnerability. Look at where, what marine heat waves did to you in the past. Look at what species or areas were affected by them. Maybe look back at a past El Nino year and have a think about what that meant for your business or your management decision framework. Um, and so some more examples of where you might look for information on the right hand side. Knowing that you can view these later, we'll speed through these a little bit faster and you can come back to them. But at the end of each one, kind of indicated whether that's the domain of a researcher or an industry or a manager or a policymaker with those codes in the first column. So I think we're beyond step one, though, in preparing for the summer along the east coast of Australia. The next slide will suggest if the risk exists, continue preparation and begin pl planning your responses. In particular, one of those actions I'd be undertaking now is consensus building amongst the group of people who will make decisions when fast action is needed. For example, in a uh, fishery business, you'd want to make sure that the, all of the decision makers know that we may need to have a response pretty soon. Um, that means formulating response plans, using the decision support tools that you have, and perhaps thinking about implementing the adaptation responses that don't have unwanted side effects. An unwanted side effect at the moment might be choosing to do your operation in a completely different part of the state that you're operating in, um, but then a marine heat wave doesn't eventuate or rainfall occurs as normal, and you might have lost out because you made a decision that was a bit too early. So only do the things that you would not regret, no matter what the future holds at the moment. In the third row down, I think you ought to be able to prioritise um, your high risk areas and think about what habitats or populations you might want to be able to um, focus on next time. And I would be knowing that I could monitor this location that I cared about with and my early warning systems were all in place. Some of those early warning system are links that Claire has shared here. In other cases, it might be in situ data from your own operations, stream flow data, oxygen sensors, and so on. Um, knowing that you can access that data when you need it is pretty important. Things like educating decision makers, and I suppose this briefing is one example of that, uh, just alerting people that these things are coming and don't be surprised about it. As a manager or policymaker, we might be looking to build ecological resilience to future warming events by reducing other pressures. 
policymakers and industry might be thinking about setting aside resources, including response funds, to manage this risk and make sure that you could deploy resources when you need to. Um, and perhaps if, for example, we we're going to see mass fish kills in some areas of inland Australia as oxygen and temperature combine to kill fish, or we're going to see strandings or disease outbreaks, um, what are the kind of assets that you need to have in place to cope with that kind of activity, uh, that kind of outcome? Thanks, Claire. Um, that stretches Claire and I a little bit in starting to think about what responses are, but definitely the expertise that you all hold in, in your day jobs, I think now would equip you well for starting to make those no regrets decisions about what to do around a pretty warm summer in the ocean and some challenging conditions on land with rainfall and temperature extremes expected there. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.